I remember Valentine's Day uh, in Miss Day's class in the third grade. Miss Day, my teacher, had us uh, each make, well, bring a little lunch bag, and then uh, we drew with crayons little hearts on it and put stickers on it, and, and those were to become the receptacles for Valentine cards that people in our class would come by and and drop into, uh, into each of our, uh, our little Valentine bags. Of course, my biggest and best one uh, went to Miss Day. Uh, I, w- I was in love. And, uh, but Miss Day reminded us all, not just me, that there was one very important rule about Valentine's Day, and that was that you needed to make a Valentine for everyone. Not just for your special friends, but for everyone. That was a good lesson. And it wasn't far from our Lord's teaching this morning. From John 15, 11 through 17. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Like Miss Day wanted all the children to know that they were loved, God wants each one of us to know that we are quite particularly loved, not just in mass, but individually. Everyone gets a valentine. I have said these things so that your, my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. I've chosen you. You did not choose me, but I've chosen you. Miss Day wanted everyone in class to have a valentine in their bag from everyone else because she wanted every child in the class to know they were important, they were loved, they were cared for, they were chosen. And God wants you to know, I, God, pick you. The valentine, of course, that he has sent is a very costly one. Ours are only a vague shadow of the expression of love that God has given to us. Still, they're meaningful to us. I I keep cards in a box in my closet. Uh, Every time I get a card that I want to keep, I just throw it in there, and uh, I figure maybe one of these days I'll be depressed and need to go through those cards. And, uh, and, and I, I remember that I had this one in there, and it's a Valentine's Day card. It just says, to Pastor Ed, happy Valentine's Day. And then on the back of it, and I, I, rem- I must have gotten this card 30 years ago, but I dug it out of the box. On the back, it's got the names of what uh, were the second grade Sunday school class of the, the church that I was pastoring at the time. And... Uh, You know, it's funny, but even just looking at it again made me smile, made me feel good. The day I got it, I didn't even know really that the second grade Sunday school class knew who Pastor Ed was. But when they, but when somebody chooses you, when they pick you, when you are given an expression of love, makes a difference, makes a difference, doesn't it? I remember from even longer than that ago, probably 50 years back, a little song that kind of keeps 
rolling around in my head about God, how God chose me, how God loved me. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was uh, having, the reason I remember it is we, I was having coffee on Friday morning, and Linda and I were, were talking, and uh, it was just in our kitchen, and she, somehow she was talking about something. She mentioned the phrase, rolled away. And I thought immediately, I thought of this song that I had learned as a, as a child, and I started to sing it for her. And uh, uh, I have no better sense than to try to sing it for you today. <laughs> and so I want to sing you this song, because all of a sudden from nowhere, 50 years later, here I am, and, I, and it goes like this. And I didn't give Linda the hand motions. You're getting the hand motions today. So I'm upgrading. So uh, here we go. It goes like this. Rolled away, rolled away, rolled away. All the burdens of my heart rolled away. Rolled away, rolled away, rolled away. All the burdens of my heart rolled away. Once my heart was heavy with the load of sin. Jesus took my heavy heart and gave me peace within my heart. And now I'm singing as the days go by. Jesus took my burdens all away. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I, I go ahead and share that with you because it's a memory from my childhood of being chosen by God. Maybe you learned Jesus loves me, this I know. Maybe that was your first song. Or maybe you didn't come to the Lord until you were an adult. But, you know, whenever we come, God chooses us. His expression to us is a personal expression of love and care. And what Jesus tells us is that our response to that should be joy. Should be joy at chosenness. Just like when we're given a valentine. It ought to just bring a smile to our faces. When we remember what God has done for us. If you believe that Jesus Christ was God incarnate who came to this earth, who lived a life that was exemplary for us, who taught us the, the meaning and the will and the heart of God in his teaching, and who then died on a cross for our sins so that we might wear his righteousness instead of our own because he paid the penalty for our sins that he died for us, that he chose us in that way. If you believe that Jesus rose on Easter, how do we say it? He is risen. He is risen indeed. That Jesus rose, not in story, not in mythology, not as a nice fairy tale, but you believe that Jesus rose indeed, the deed of conquering death. If that's what you believe, it ought to give you a sense of joy, of great joy. Because no matter what problem, what struggle we face in life, God has ultimately overcome it. We are victors in Jesus Christ. I have a, a little, uh, I had for many years, a poster over my study desk at home. And it was a castle, and from the top turret in the castle, there were flags flying. And then on the, uh, the little uh, banner at the bottom, there was just the, these words, Joy is the banner flown from the castle of our hearts when the king is in residence. Joy is the banner flown from the castle of our hearts when the king is in residence. You know, that suggests to, suggests to me that there really ought to be no dreary, no humorless Christians. If God has made a laughing stock of the graveyard, how dare we not connect what God has done with a sense of underlying joy in our lives? Now, I don't mean a giddiness or a happiness. I don't mean a superficial joy but a joy that's so deep that it does bring a smile to our hearts, a tear to our eyes, a sense of purpose and of ultimate and abundant love that God has given us. The dear, dreary Christian makes God a liar because Jesus has said, I have said these things to you so that you, my joy may be in you and your joy 
should be complete. So I want to suggest to you this morning that if joy is not at the center of your Christian experience, you may need a therapist. Uh, you may need a pastor. You may need a Stephen minister to get you through a hard time, or uh, you may need some kind of medical intervention, and that's okay if you do, but I want to tell you that's not the normal state of the Christian. The Christian is one who says, no matter what the struggles, what the loss, what the pain in my life, God has sent me a valentine that is greater than all. The valentine of his incarnate love in Jesus Christ. But Mrs. Day was right. This valentine is not just for us to have from God and sort of hold in our hearts forever. Valentines are meant to be shared with everyone. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one is greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You're my friends if you do what I command you. And I appointed you to go and to bear lasting fruit. We know that the two great commandments that Jesus gave us were to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. But if you can't quite get to loving your neighbor, if that's too hard, I'd suggest that our passage allows a place that we could begin in order to get there. Love God and make friends. Love God and be so joyous about the love that God has expressed to you and his valentine to you that the natural inclination now becomes to work on making friends, to make friends with those around you. It's not a bad mission statement. Love God and make friends. Because when you truly make a friend, sooner or later, if they really are a friend, they're going to get to know what makes you tick. And if what makes you tick at the center of your life is the joy of the resurrected living Jesus who calls you each and every day to discover the exciting adventure of life with him, your friends eventually are going to get the drift of that in your life. I want to give you two examples of uh, two folks that I know who have done that. One is from the life of this congregation, and one is uh, from my own life uh, some time ago. Uh, the first one is uh, about two men in this congregation. One of them was a staunch, conservative, uh, red Republican. Very conservative. Uh, very committed. The other was a progressive blue Democrat. Equally committed to his perspectives. The thing is, every once in a while, they would come together and uh, they soon found that they had a lot of other things that uh, weren't at odds. Most of which centered in their faith. They each believed that Jesus Christ had been God's valentine to them. But they also believed... I think rightly so, that our faith ought to inform our politics. I mean, our faith ought to inform everything. How we parent, uh, how we work, it ought to inform our politics too. We ought to ask, what would Jesus think about the stand that I want to take this way or that way? It's just that these two men, right in this congregation, would look to the Bible, look to Jesus, and then when it came to politics, they one would say, I think Jesus would be here, and the other would say, I think Jesus would be there. They learned to differ in Christian love, but not to doubt one another's faith or belief in Jesus. And as a result, they never demonized each other. They never called one another stupid. They never called into question one another's integrity. They learned 
to love God and to be friends in Jesus. Friends who disagreed on some things, but friends. And when one came sick, very seriously ill, and had to go to the hospital and to rehab and continued to go downhill, the other friend was there visiting time after time after time. And when that one friend passed, there was the other friend at the memorial service praising God for his friend in Jesus who didn't see the world the way he saw it in terms of politics but who trusted that his friend loved Jesus and Jesus loved him and that somehow that bond was greater and it made a difference. Everyone, not just those we like, are to receive God's valentines. And you and I are to deliver them with our attitudes and our actions and our words. Love God and make friends. The other example is... uh, of being a valentine from the heart of God to others is uh, taken out of uh, the life of my mom who only stood about uh, five feet tall. Actually, she was under five feet tall. Uh, But uh, as a third grade uh, teacher, uh, she also knew how to be very uh, stern and very strong. And if uh, you were uh, uh, in the, the elementary school that she taught at and you were out on the playground during recess and you were misbehaving, uh, no matter how tall you were, you knew you were not going to be taller in, uh, in um, responsibility and uh, in authority than Mrs. Ewart. You were going to spend the rest of recess sitting on the lunch benches if you misbehaved. And so because of uh, her strength in enforcing the rules, uh, she got a reputation. Some of the kids would call her mean Mrs. Ewart. But you know, the kids that got into her class, and of course they were in fear and trembling when they were assigned to her class, but once they got to know her, they began to see another side. That other side was love and mercy and grace. You had to work hard. But Mrs. Ewart was even kind of fun to be around. And one year she had a particularly tough class Her school was in a pretty rough neighborhood, and it seemed as though every child in her class had relational issues, homes that were going through struggles of one kind or another, always economic pressures. This was way back in the 60s when our political uh, and uh, legal issues were far, uh, far less emphasized. So she went to her principal and she said, you know, I'd just like to give each of these kids a kind of immersement in love. Would it be okay if I took them home, five kids at a time, for a Friday night and a Saturday, and just just had a great time with them? Just kind of loved on them a little. My husband and my son, they'll, they'll help. And would that be okay? Well, the principal didn't know what to do with this, but he, he, he loved my mom so much, he said, listen, here's what I've decided finally. He said, this is not a school function. They cannot meet at school to be picked up. But if what you and your family want to do on your own is you want to go pick them up at their individual houses, you can take them home to spend an overnight and do whatever it is that you want to do. And he kind of looked the other way. And mom began to bring five kids. It took us, I think, about seven weekends. Girls one weekend, boys the other. And here's what we did. Here's what mean Mrs. Ewart did. We began with a miniature golf game. There were three of us in our family, and there were uh, uh, five of them that came. So there were eight. So we made up teams, and and we we played uh, miniature golf together. You almost needed a crash helmet for some of the kids. You're kind of worried where those balls were going to go. But we played miniature golf. We had just a great time doing it. Then we went to the local burger joint. 
and everybody was allowed to order. It was the same order for everyone. This was the disciplinarian coming out, you know. No, I wasn't going to fuss around with a lot of different stuff. Everybody gets a burger, fries, and a Coke. That's it. If you were a vegan, who knew? We didn't even know what vegans were. <laughs> That's what you got. And then after, after you'd, you'd had a, a meal together, and a lot of these kids didn't go out much, 31 Flavors had just moved into our neighborhood. And so you got to go to 31 Flavors, and you got a scoop of your choice of ice cream. You got to choose your flavor of ice cream anyway. And, uh, and my dad used to just love to see the different ways that the kids would eat it. You know, some would lick it and some would bite it. And others just, after it was over, looked like they just smeared it, you know. But he, he got such a kick out of it. And then after the evening was over and we laughed and we talked about it and it was time to go to bed, mom just closed with a very short prayer. Asked for the Lord to watch over us as we slept. And then we went to bed. And... Those kids didn't fool around. You know, this was not an all-night party. They knew Mrs. Ewart was upstairs. They went to bed, sleeping in bed rolls in our living room. And the next morning, we got up. Saturday morning, Mom fixed a, a pancake and sausage breakfast, before which there was a brief prayer of thanksgiving. By the way, all the parents had been sent a letter telling them everything that we were going to do, including the next thing on the list. And, and, the, and the parents had had to sign off and say it was okay. And they all agreed to let their kids come. And the next thing on the list was to go to mom's church where there was this big pipe organ and all the pipes were in front and the organist practiced every Saturday for Sunday services. So the kids went and listened to that huge pipe organ play. And they, most of them had never heard a pipe organ before. And it was so powerful, it filled the room. And then they went up and they talked to the organist and they looked at all the pedals and they watched her play. And then mom, being, this is a Baptist church, she had a way of kind of sneaking them back around. She showed them the baptistry and just told them a little bit, nothing high pressure, just a little bit about what Christian baptism is. Then came the really fun part. We went to Buffum's department store. Buffum's department store had something unheard of. It was a moving stairway. It was an escalator. And back in the 1960s, there was no, no other building in town that had this. And, uh, and so she carefully instructed the kids, now, you're going to get to go up the elevator to the second floor, then you have to get on it and come back down. And it's only one time, so enjoy it. But, you know, it's only one time. And don't horse around on the elevator but enjoy it. Isn't this a marvelous thing? And the kids, I'll tell you, they went up and down that elevator with such dignity. And uh, they were so well controlled. They looked, they, uh, they looked like angels ascending and descending Jacob's ladder. They were just right there uh, uh, doing what mom asked them to do. And then after that, we went to the park. We had a, a small softball game. And then we cooked weenies and and hot dogs, and then we took them home. Mrs. Ewart, mean Mrs. Ewart, that's what she did. Because she wanted those feel, kids to feel loved. She wanted to, she wanted to kind of hand out a few valentines of God's love to the kids that she taught. Now, I'm not suggesting that teachers do that today. You couldn't get away with that today. Each generation, I think, each of us, we have to figure out, we who have received the valentine of God's love, how we're going to give it away to others. And it's going to be a different way for each one of us, perhaps. How to love God and how to make friends. But when you do, the people to whom you give valentines will come to see that you are a friend maker. And they'll be astounded if they find that you're a friend maker even with people who are different than you. And eventually, if we do that, I think people see the heart of God's love within us. Everyone counts. We've all been chosen. 
God's valentine is not just for some, but for everyone. And we, in turn, are to pass his heart to everyone by whatever means we can. So I want to encourage you in this week of hearts and candy and flowers and poems to remember to love God and to make friends. Because if God has rolled away your sin, he's also called you to become a valentine. That's your calling, he says. Not just this week, but every week. To become a valentine, not only to our friends, but to the people who you disagree with. But people for whom Christ died and whom Christ loves. Love God, and because Jesus loved you, have some fun out of the joy that he has given you and make friends with that fun. I know Miss Day would approve, but more importantly, so does Jesus. Pray with me. Gracious God, for your immense heart of love, a heart that you bid us hand on to others, sometimes, if need be, sacrificially, we give you thanks for the love and for the calling. And now we pray that you would give us the power to deliver what you command of us. In Jesus' name, amen.